So about ACS, I've actually uh, pulled out the same slideshow I used last time, um, but I've changed a few different things because the pathway's changed. It has driven me insane, uh, but I think that um, uh, I'm a lesser person for it. RCAs drive what we do, so what we want to do is we want to stop people dying. We don't want to create something that's perfect and makes an individual working in a large hospital happy or satisfies their most recent 500 papers that they've read. Um, because I've read the last 600 papers and I'm never going to be happy about troponins. But I'm happy about the way that we might be able to use them uh, in a system sensibly. Now this is the uh, front page of the thing which you've seen. Uh, this is what one of the older ones looked like. It looked a bit like this and then we got worried and it went somewhere else and then it looked like this. And now it's changed again. A lot of it was based on the Australian Heart Foundation paper, which, like a lot of things, uh, developed by a number of people sitting in a room, a number of them uh, cardiologists, a number of ED clinicians and some wonderful brains, such as Louise Cullen uh, and co. But there was a lot of input that came into it. Uh, and it was all old by the time it was published. Um, so they still were talking about a lot of grace. They had a lot of these sort of um, uh, wonderful pathways which may or may not work for you, but there was a lot of them. And there was a lot of decision points. So you could do Timmy zero or two, you could do it at three hours, you could do it at two hours. So very difficult to apply uh, across the board. So what we've discovered after all of this is that you don't have to follow our pathway at all. But we're going to put it up there uh, and try and, uh, we'll call it a, uh, you can, the other thing, you want to call it a guideline pathway, you know, a thingy. I'll call it a thingy. What we want you to do is to let our thingy guide the way that you look at ACS or chest pain patients in your ED. Because the way that you use the thingy in your relationship with your cardiologist and the relationship with your doctors given their level of uh, training and the amount of seniority that you have in your department is much more important than 20%, 30%, 15%, 5 nanograms per litre or 7 nanograms per litre. Absolutely none of that matters. You could just roll a dice and choose a number and choose some units and that would be okay. But the key thing is using it in the correct context for your place and that's the most important thing. The, I did have another thing up there on Slido about the uh, past pathway and paper path. How many people, apart from the young person sitting next to Michael the other day, um, see paper pathways getting checked off, tick boxed off in their departments? Anybody in the last year seen one? You have? Oh, that's good. Three, four, oh, more than I thought. Yep. Some, some do, some don't. Yep. So, great point by Trish. So the thing is, is that we could do anything. We could have a pathway on how to change a tyre. We could have a pathway on anything. Call it the chest pain pathway. Call it Eugene. And if you followed that, the RCAs wouldn't happen. And we looked at, uh, or I looked at, uh, a large number of RCAs over the last five years, and in which a, a number of people died. Um, and had you followed any pathway ever designed for chest pain, uh, badness wouldn't have happened at the end. But we don't get up every morning and put our pants on, um, after we've ironed them of course, uh, thinking that I want to do just okay, we want to do exceptionally well, we want to do the best, so I think that we should follow a pathway that works for you. Now, the big cognitive question, we'll get into the details, but as I said, the details don't matter. ED is about risk. Cardiology are about diagnosis. That's easy. We know that. You know, we know that we're all about determining what's going to happen. We can get to a certain period of risk. Sometimes we'll make the diagnosis. But at the back end, they're all about um, determining whether they've got an infarct or not. But it's two different things. We've always focused a little bit on low risk, uh, high risk, intermediate risk. But I think we're more in tune with are they high risk? No. Are they low risk? No. Then they're not high risk, not low risk. We have to think a bit more about them. And I probably should just stop there, but I will go on. Now, 
for pulmonary embolus, does anyone uh, not use wells or a PE thing and D-dimers? So that everybody likes that? Does it work for you? So initially it didn't work that well when the British Thoracic Society got very worried because all of a sudden they were doing more CTPAs because everybody that come in with uh, pneumonia uh, got a D-dimer done and then they ended up getting a CTPA. But we kind of worked that out a little bit now and they've refined it down to likely, unlikely, do a D-dimer, bang, you know, you're out of here. So it works well because they do a pre-test probability and they do a clinical assessment. But as we've developed pathways over the years, the people that initially developed pathways were the diagnosis people. The people that developed Timmy and, and Grace, and, and Grace is fantastic, it's got like goes up to 300. Um, I just love to work that one out, it's just nice to do, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. But the people that developed our pathways, they were interested in the diagnosis in the back end, they weren't interested in risk and they didn't think like we do and like we do with something like Wells criteria. It's all about clinical risk. And the reason I think that's important, I'm not saying that Timmy didn't work and wonderful, great, great, great. But if you think in terms of uh, a, a risk assessment that involves your testing, you're jumping too far ahead and you're also not cognitively keeping in mind that a patient who starts off at high risk or intermediate risk in terms of the background and the way they presented doesn't necessarily change with the test. This is particularly relevant to the not high risk, not low risk group. So the patients that we're getting in trouble with are the patients in the not high risk, not low risk or intermediate for people that like that word. And they have a normal troponins or no delta and normal ECGs they're still not low risk. So this is the group that we need to think about. The patients that are low risk, and however you want to do it, I can do the follow the Norwegians and they get a less than lower limited detection and they can go home straight away, or I can do two hours and they've got a normal delta and they don't need, they don't need stress testing, that's great, we're all happy with that. But this intermediate group, it's very important for me that we look at our pathway in, in this term, in these terms. Um, the identified problems from the RCAs was a, uh, a lack of poor, uh, lack or poor clinical assessment. We can't really fix that with a pathway. Um, there was an ongoing clinical assessment. Maybe we can fix that with a pathway. If you've got to tick that box, did you look at them again? Um, appropriate use of tests, that's easy, and appropriate follow-up of tests. They were all the things that killed people. Did a troponin, didn't look at it, didn't do a second troponin, um, didn't actually, you know, uh, there was a shift change, didn't go and review the patient, that sort of stuff. It's not about the specifics. But I think that if we have a pathway or a Eugene or a thingy that directs us to train our doctors and our clinicians uh, and also directs them to communicate with their cardiologist on what we're actually doing, I think it'll work better. So a good protocol pathway guideline Eugene thingy should uh, allow for good clinical practice judgment where it's available, mitigate for risk where it's less satisfactory, lead users to make good safe decisions and prompt, prompt rethinking, allow them to ask or call, call for help or support, and in the worst case scenario, keep patients alive when Michael's locum with the Oxford 2001 emergency care uh, is looking after your patients. It's going to be hard to get. So this is the new thingy. Um, it's got less colours on it than Michael because this is version 3,262. He had 3,261. Um, the idea of it is, is that uh, on one side is the cognitive process and on this side is your details because we're about the cognitive process. This is not the tick box thing, this is the thing that they look at to, to learn and think about what they're doing. Because I know that um, it's, it's not that long ago that I came back out of the wilderness into emergency medicine and I used to read a lot of these things to try and see how are people thinking now. You know, when you're a, a, an adult student and you come back into a, a system, uh, you know, I was at a, at being a GP for a long time and never really studied or worked that hard, coming into an emergency department, I wanted to see how was it that people are thinking? And I'm sure a number of our junior doctors want to know, how do I approach this? 
we, get, we teach and all that sort of stuff, but we know that there's a lot of gaps in what we do teach because we've got a, a rapidly rotating and um, population workforce. So this is the pathway. I don't know if the pointer actually works on this. It does? Oh, oh. So is it high risk? Clinical risk assessment? Um, no. Is it low risk? No. Then it's intermediate risk. That's what we want everyone to think. Um, and then you can look at your risk assessments. The Australia, uh, Australian Heart Foundation has got definitions of risk. Low risk, uh, we've put EDAX and heart up there. Heart's a bit of a fraud too. It's got a foot in the Timmy camp because it uses troponins. Um, it's using it, putting a test into the clinical assessment. So heart's been validated. Um, it was the first of the ED clinical-esque um, uh, assessment tools. Um, but I think it's going to, hopefully it'll go out with the bathwater as well. I think EDAX um, is the new way, that's my personal opinion, um, because it's a clinical one. And it also works with the guy with the Oxford 2001 because it doesn't say highly suspicious, moderately suspicious. It says if you've got pain in your chest, does it go into your jaw, are they diaphoretic? So there's more chance of them getting that right. So when you think back to one of the things that we want this to do is to work and mitigate uh, for idiocy. So the next we go down to the troponins. Uh, is it positive? So that's, is it above the 99th centile or the upper limit of your range or the upper range of normal? Now. The, you don't have to know what the 99th centile means, but you've got a range uh, in your troponins. You've got the bottom bit, uh, which is the lower limit of detection, so that's the smallest bit you can see, and then you've got the 99th centile. It's not actually the normal range. And the interesting thing is, is that when you talk to uh, all of the pathologies, um, uh, the labs around the state, and you look at all of the research in terms of what those numbers are, and, and everybody uh, just uses their own number. Kind of close. You know, the Roach, Troponin T, the lower limits, three or five, depending on uh, what people want to use. But there, there are actually lab settings, and we know that these are for a population, so when people are using slightly different numbers, it's not because the other guy's wrong, it's because that lab's decided that that's their normal, uh, that's the normal population. And most labs in larger centres will actually uh, test for that. So, for example, our Roche T high sensitivity troponin is 3 to 15. It started off at 5 to 15. Um, the the uh, manufacturers have got 3 to 15. It's actually 2.9 or something like that. But that those numbers don't matter. So if, the, if you see a, a number up there that makes you mad and angry, um, what I want you to do is to go outside and just reflect for a while and have an Earl Grey tea. <laughs> the, the exact numbers don't matter. It could be, and also, in this, we've referred to this as the most glorious pathway, thingy or guideline. You can use your own numbers. A, because they don't matter, but B, you might have read something slightly different. So you might want to use four, you might want to use seven, you might want to use three. That will depend on your perception of risk, your interpretation of the um, 365 papers that were published yesterday on this, uh, and, um, and also your interaction with your cardiologists and who they met at the last European Society for Cardiology. All of our cardiologists um, at Prince of Wales, except for the guy who couldn't get on the plane, went to uh, last year's European Society for Cardiology uh, and they were very happy uh, with shortened time frames. So they were very excited about, uh, they heard about the one hour troponin, high sensitivity troponin rule, but they were all excited about the two hours uh, amongst themselves in terms of discussion. The timing of when you do troponins is, is um, up for debate. Uh, and again, if you read in great detail uh, all of the trials, um, I think that two and three hours is, is getting safe. Now, what we want people to do is, we know that if your troponin is a few above the normal limit, that it might just be because you've got a little bit of renal failure. 
So if that's the case, you can come back off the pathway and you can become intermediate if somebody senior is talked to. That's all we want to happen with this pathway. In some places I know that, uh, for example, in some of the smaller, smaller hospitals or regional hospitals, if somebody is above the 99th centile or outside the, um, the upper limit of normal, they're admitted and assessed by the cardiology team the next day. In the bigger centres, if we did that, everybody that comes in with chest pain in our place has got renal failure and they're 200 years old, so they would all be going into hospital. Uh, and we've also got the luxury of, of having 10 emergency consultants ready to see people at any, any given point of time, which is, we know is different um, to uh, out in the sticks. So I guess there's a number of take-home messages, is that we should clinically assess patients, we should do our tropinology, wonderful word, and we should put in all the extra bits into it, uh, if we're in bigger places, we can say, well, granny's 90, we're not going to do anything anyway, but the renal failure there, it's, it's, we did a, um, uh, we've done a troponin, it's 60, and we repeated it, and it's 60. We weren't going to do anything anyway. So then we get the borderline cases, the 60-year-old, where it's just a couple above. We did a repeat troponin, and it stayed a couple above. If we're at Centre of Excellence, Prince of Wales, then this is a discussion based on the risk for that patient. Because we know not low risk can be almost low risk, right up to almost high risk. It's a broad range and that's the risk group. So to get out of that group, we think that you either need to be admitted for further testing, you might need to get a further troponin done if it was borderline in terms of change, uh, or you may be able to get discharged, but the follow-up should be done. We don't want you exercise stress testing, the 45-year-old who didn't have ACS in the first place, who got two troponins and they were normal, or they were both below the lower limited detection, whatever you choose and what want to use. They shouldn't be exercise stress tested. The people that should be tested and looked at are the intermediate group. And that's the, that's the message. So the high risk, you, you know, this low risk, intermediate risk. So, in terms of introducing this pathway, uh, the form uh, has a series of benchmarks that, uh, that your form, your much better than our form, uh, can use. We're going to have this up on the website as a Word document, so that not just sort of the PDF, so you can pull out the box that's got all the troponins in there. Now, when we first started doing this, we were told that there was like 2,000 different types of troponins, but in actual fact, there's three major high sensitivity troponins that are used in the public health system and three uh, point of care tests. There's actually not that many. What we would like uh, eventually and what Dr Golding's going to try and do is uh, just have one test so that we can kind of contro control it and standardise it a little bit because they do vary a wee bit. Um, if you talk to the pathologist and and we've got a wonderful group of pathologists and scientists in New South Wales pathology. Um, it's really hard uh, the determining which is the best test to use because of the three high sensitivity tests now um, about to be published, um, which is going to rock the whole obsessive compulsive troponin disorder community, um, is, is that one of the super high sensitivity tests is not actually high sensitivity because the coefficient of variation at eight nanograms per litre is not exactly 10 or under it. So be prepared for that. <laughs> I just want to warn you. Thrombolysis, also known as fibrinolysis. This was a, a point of great debate. Fibrinolysis is a cardiology term and thrombolysis is one we know because of all the great work we've done with strokes. Um, We've kind of tidied this up a little bit. Again, the cognitive part is on one side and the details are on the other because we want the cognitive part to go on first. That's most important. The details don't really matter because as we know with antiplatelet therapy, the details change on a daily basis and sometimes from hour to hour and sometimes at the same time depending on who you're talking to. Now, this is the EDAX. And I, I kind of like this. And if you talk to Louise Cullen uh, et al. who come up with this, she's very smart. 
and they derived this and validated it in ED settings. And the thing I really liked about it when they first did it was is that they didn't really want to put risk factors in, but they threw it out to the, well, what are you missing? You know how we have teddy bear things we like to hold on to, you know, flash pulmonary edema, cardiologists want to fill them up with frusamide, even though they got better on nitrates and BiPAP. Those things, that, so we have, we didn't want to give up our risk factors. So they put it back in. Didn't make any difference, but it's back in there. Um, but what they did do is that it's age adjusted, so risk factors um, are ignored after a certain age, which there's a number of studies demonstrating that. This is your heart, which is, I quite like this when it first came out and it's been validated and it works. There's nothing wrong with heart, there's nothing wrong with Timmy. All wonderful, wonderful, love them. If you love them, I love them. But it doesn't really work that well if you're out west and you're the idiot. I'll just summarise it as the idiot rather than the locum with the Oxford. It just makes it quicker, the idiot. Because highly suspicious, moderately suspicious, and slightly or not suspicious is very, very tricky. I know this is validated and it works, but what this demonstrates is anything works. Absolutely anything works. So if you're going to use anything, why not use an anything that makes sense to an idiot? You don't have to in your big metropolitan places. I'm sure there are no idiots in the big metropolitan places. So I want you to, when you're looking at this, when it comes out, I want you to think of me <laughs> and my family and all the things that have been affected. And I've cycled a lot less in the last six months because of this bloody thing. And I'm not that happy about it. But what I am happy about is, is that with all of that reading and endless troponin, blah, blah, and all the stuff that Wayne understands, and I have no idea what it is, capery things and that sort of stuff, I realise that the numbers don't matter that much. It's all about the clinical assessment, adding your tropinology, getting something that works, communicating with your cardiologists. I talked with our cardiologist, who actually, they are a wonderful bunch. And if you talk to them, you realise that, unlike us, because we are, most of the people in here and most of the faces in here I know are got a little bit of an OCD on various different things. I'm looking at one over there who's shaking and nodding his head furiously. But you realise is that when they've read two papers, um, for every two they've read, you've read about 300. So frame your discussions simply and bear in mind that they're not always going to get the, the subtleties of it, but work towards patient care and safety, because that's really what we're going to do with this. Uh, disposition, so assess the risk, add your tests like we do with PE, and then we combine them and we decide on where they're going to go. To get off the high risk, they need to have senior input. If you're out in the WAPs, then that means that you've got to phone a friend. If they're a little bit closer, then that means that you've got, you have to talk to the rotating registrar. Um, the amount of risk that you're uh, able to accept, uh, and I know that that varies a little bit depending on the most recent RCA, um, and that's going to change the way that you work. But hopefully this pathway, uh, and you can do your wee bits and pieces and change it, and I'm more than happy uh, to come and talk to your place um, about the pathway uh, and change it to suit your needs. But you not only need senior input to get off the high risk part, you need senior input to get out of hospital if you're intermediate, because that's the risk group. And senior, you make your own definitions. Now, we were lucky enough to engage or did they engage us? The help of the forms committee. <laughs> now I don't know if there's anybody from the forms committee in the audience today. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> no, I really do. They're wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And so we did produce a form with tick boxes and 
I'm quite surprised. There were a number of hands that went up before. We do, we do. There is a role for this. Um, so we'll be printing out 45,000 of these and sending them out to EDs um, if you want to use them. And I think the the good thing about the form is is that the pathway informs how you think. The form is a cognitive aid to see if you actually did it. Now I'm a wee bit sort of torn with forms because I think EMR is a wonderful thing. I've embraced it from the start and the sky didn't fall on my head. Um, and I think that, you know, maybe these cheeky listy things are, are, are going to go on there. Um, and of course it's from the forms committee and uh, well, they've informed us about it. Uh, and it's wonderful. So I'll leave you with that. <laughs>